welcome to Artery. This is a group of artists, call, they call themselves Artery. They have been actually using some of the storefronts along Main Street in the downtown and the historical center to display their artwork, to try to you know make sure that the public still knows they're here and that they're selling it. And they were putting together this festival and the uh, commission found out about it. And we said, well, we want to help. We'll help, we can host you. We can help provide you with some advertising. And so that's why we're here. They're all independent Tacoma Park artists. We've actually been supporting Artery um, in terms of helping them with their website fund and giving them some funding for that. And then we've also been donating some small amounts of money to various local artists for work. Like we helped Trap Bob paint the tables out in front of Tacoma Bev Company and things like that. We've done, most of our events of course have been virtual. The community center has been closed. So some of our normal events that the commission does we, has not happened. But so this is kind of like our first like public in-person big event that I think we've done in almost a year. So this is actually very exciting and the people coming in and walking through seem really happy just to like be out and see art and talk to people and there'll be live music later on. This is the first art fair by the Tacoma Artery which is a new uh, nonprofit local arts group which was formed during the pandemic by Eleanor Landstreet and a friend who realized there weren't a lot of places for artists to show their work and so they arranged for artists to put some of their artwork in display windows uh, in vacant or underused storefronts and then there was also an idea to do an art fair so as the arts coordinator for the city of Tacoma Park I, I worked with them to organize this fair with 20 artists and a band and so it's been a good way to sort of welcome the arts back to Tacoma Park and, and give artists a place to, to sell their work. So uh, we're excited to be part of it. I originally was a painter. I got an undergraduate degree in art um, and majoring in painting. Uh, and then I kind of got away from that for a while. And about seven or eight years ago, I started uh, learning how to do fused glass and took some classes. And now I have a studio in our basement and have four or five kilns. Fused glass, um, all of this glass is made by a company in Portland, Oregon called Bullseye, and they make the glass so that it all will melt together and um, be compatible with its, each other because if you mix two different kinds of glass, they, won't, they will react when they've been heated up and cooled down, and so they will break or crack. So you have to use all the glass that's compatible um, together and I take the glass either in sheet form, um, it also comes in powders and little granules called frit, and I use it to basically paint on the glass and then I bring it up to a temperature of about 1400 degrees and it all fuses together. There are ways that you can make straight lines. You can cut uh, the glass into small, uh, small pieces of glass to make straight lines. You can also mask things off to use powders to make straight lines. Uh, the most difficult thing is waiting for it to, uh, to come out of the kiln because it's always kind of a surprise what you're going to make and uh, what, how it's going to look once it's fused together, especially when you're layering colors. Um, it's, uh, it's always a, a question of how they're going to react with each other. Probably the most difficult thing is to make a large vessel um, because you have to make sure that you heat it up um, very slowly and cool it down slowly So because there's a large mass of glass so there's a danger of it cracking when you cool it down. Now the jewelry is pretty fun. I actually usually make it from small pieces of glass that are left over from larger pieces. I fuse them back together and then uh, make them into a jewelry piece. Yeah, the photograph is done from a, an old photo um, that I took and you put it into Photoshop and made a decal out of it and then I uh, fused the decal into the glass. It's, it's uh, made from a, a decal that has a large content of iron and the iron actually reacts with the glass when it's heated up and creates that uh, sepia tone. I'm always taking classes uh, different places. I'm going to be taking a couple classes up in New Jersey next uh, fall so that I learn some new techniques. There's, there's always a bunch of uh, other techniques to learn from other artists. It's, it really is uh, unlimited, the, the kind of thing that you can do with it. And I'm always learning new things just working in my studio, uh, experimenting with different techniques. I started with abstracts, then along the way I started trying 
um, faces like I'm doing right now. I started with yeah, with basically abstract. Then later, a friend challenged me and said, "Why is it that abstract? You can't do something different." So I said, "Yeah, I, I can." So she was like, "Okay, art challenge." Then from there, I started adding faces to the abstract um, paintings that I do. So recently, I started mixing with a paste and glue to form a base and I started mixing all colors then it just tremendous that the way it comes out and I'm, I'm wild at all this that I do because if you really ask me I don't know when I do them and I think it just comes from my soul um first of all like the sunset I had to go watch sunset from there I have it all in my heart that I don't need to watch any sunset to paint sunset anymore so from there it became natural so I've been to a lot of places to see how um, the environment is because um, I believe my work talks about people talks about family talks about environment talks about the world that we live in so in order for me to represent that I have to visit a lot of places i have to visit a lot of states countries and i as i visit those areas i bring back one thing with me when i went to Atlanta, georgia i went to savannah down to savannah georgia i went to watch the sunset and i brought a, a bit of savannah with me so when i go to i went to the national harbor when I got there, I brought a piece with me. So all the places that I go to, I went to Minnesota, anywhere I go, I try to bring something that is meaningful that I will always remember. Okay, when I was in Minnesota, this is the idea that I got. When I was in um, Florida, this is what I got. When I, so different places that I go to, I try to bring one art with me. So it's already in my head. So when I get here, I start, you know bringing them out with a canvas so I speak the language my language with my brush with my paint on my canvas I use um, acrylic I use uh, spray paint that's the new latest one that I just discovered those are the ones that are out there the spray paint but the spray paint are acrylic spray paint so I started trying that to see how that's gonna come out and that's what you see there. Then I use the glue, I use the, the paste, I mix them together to form the, uh, the relief that you see over there. So I have acrylic ink, oil colors and paste and beads. You can see the beads right there with the art. So I, anything I see, glass, I glue it to the canvas and see and I just want to see how it's going to look like if it pops I do that so basically yeah those are my mediums I do 3d I do 2d yes I like to do people but I'm scared especially the part that I'm scared with is their nose I don't want to get anybody's wrong nose wrongly so that they'll be like no that's not my nose you know <laughs> So uh, that's the only thing that I think is the next step for me, doing portraits. And I hope I master it like I've done the abstract. So I've done this, I've mastered this, so I need to move to the next uh, level, and which is the portraits. I am a, a designer, printmaker, and art educator based in Washington, D.C. And I have my own online store called Lavender Lizard Press, where I make and sell handmade, screen printed uh, textiles and art prints. And today I'm just doing a, a DIY on the go screen print demo for the public so they can see more what I do and how I make everything that I'm selling today. Um, I've mostly done art my whole life, but I didn't learn this process of screen printing until I went to college. And I had a, I was in a wonderful program and they taught me all that I needed to know and now I work and teach at the Pyramid Atlantic Art Center in Hyattsville, so I've been able to continue my practice there and hone in on, you know, 
advancing my skills and, and techniques and stuff like that to, to get to where I am now. I would say the most difficult part is the, the registration. So if you're doing more than one colors in a, in a print or an image, you wanna line up those colors so that they fit together. But today I'm just doing a one color image so I don't have to worry about registering different colors. But um, most of my work here is, is multicolor prints and, and etchings and stuff, so I have to think about how do certain colors fit together, how do they look next to each other, that kind of thing. So you kind of have to think like five or six steps ahead of where you are at the time, you know. So I like plan on all my colors and my layers and I mix everything myself too, so it's kind of thinking like, you know, like like I said, like six or, or seven steps ahead of, ahead of what, where I am. I mostly do a lot of um, narrative drawing in my work so a lot of my work is about women and womanhood and uh, mental health and you know identity and stuff like that i like to do these like rambunctious you know cowgirls and skater girls kind of empowering women type narratives and um, i like to use the bright like bright colors in my work too to sort of attract that kind of you know vibrancy and in my work as well um, and then I also have gotten into doing more textile work recently too, so I love printing on different fabrics and patterns and just kind of like hyper, you know, visual, bright, vibrant kind of stuff. I teach over at the Pyramid Atlantic Art Center. It's a small, well actually relatively large like nonprofit organization. We have screen printing, paper making, letterpress, book binding, and printmaking studio set up there. We also have a gallery space. Um, and we have private studio artists there too that work in the space and teach and it's kind of like a cool collective in a way in Hyattsville. Um, so that's where I do a lot of my work and have a practice there. At the beginning of the pandemic, we actually, Pyramid closed down for a couple months so I was mostly working from home. So I sort of transitioned from screen printing to other like at home artworks and stuff. Like I got back into painting again, I started doing some cyanotype printing and some sun printing so all I need is like you know the outdoors and the sun and I'm good to go but thinking of other ways to like use materials that I already have at home to create my artwork so getting into more you know sewing and textiles um, trying like you know learning how to make paper from home and stuff like that so finding ways that I can make art you know in my small like you know uh, <laughs> my small room in a, in a house in DC so it's like you kind of learning how to work with what you got when you don't have a whole lot but then sort of sharing it in a way too like Pyramid started doing online workshops so I've been able to teach remotely that way and it's fun like in a challenging way to like get people to figure out like okay what do I have at home what can I use in place of these tools that I had before in this art space like I can just use a spoon to make a block printer I can like make a like a mold and deco for paper making with like a screen door mesh and then some stretcher bars or something like figuring out ways to like make do with what you got I guess was how like I adjusted to the pan pandemic and how I taught in the pandemic too because that's also a challenge too it's like teaching online and figuring out how to translate these like tangible you know like functional practices that you need to have a space for to like your at home set up and again like using what you have so that was mostly what I did last year and figuring out how to do that with different people as well. My, my current body of work that I'm working on is is mostly based in textiles and so I'm doing a lot of like garment making and quilting and stuff like that and I'm sort of transitioning to doing more sculptural work as well and so I'm, I'm trying to find that medium of like taking my narrative work into a, a physical 3D sort of setting and I'm, I'm actually in this great collective of uh, artists that are sort of helping me work through it. They're all sculptors and I'm the only printmaker so I'm like learning from other people that I meet and figuring out this like new step and process and, and whatnot so it's yeah that's kind of at least where I'm at right now <laughs> is working through all that sort of stuff but yeah. My dad was a photographer so when I was growing up you know everybody in the family had a brownie camera and he would take us to the dark room at the university where he would show us how to do the whole enlargement stuff and all of that. We put together a show because he's a photographer as well a couple of years ago in Wisconsin and in interviewing him to do the bio stuff I learned that he and mom had offered each of his kid daughters for as a graduation present a choice of a camera, 
a sewing machine or a typewriter and all three of us picked a camera. So all of us took pictures of a variety of sorts for a very long time. My sister does landscapes and close-ups of bees and birds and stuff, which they're beautiful. I can't do that for love nor money. So um, several years ago when we were out and about traveling, I decided that um, I liked some of the graffiti and the mural work that was on the walls. Bright, colorful, profane, a lot of political stuff. Um, and I thought a lot of it was just kind of funny. So then I started doing that. and. Um, so now when we travel, I will scope out to see if the place that we're going to has a reputation for graffiti or street murals. And then also see where they're kind of areas where there are abandoned buildings or railroad yards or industrial areas that um, might be a good place for people to go and just express themselves on the walls with paint. Been around a lot in the United States. Uh, there are two places three places I would recommend. Um, one is in Richmond. Richmond has an amazing wealth of murals that are across the board um, in terms of style and theme and everything. Um, St. Petersburg in Florida is also wonderful and they do everything from all the back walls and the buildings to the big dumpsters that you know the guys come up, waste management comes up and picks. And then there's a place in Iowa called Dubuque which also has a really wonderful street art community. So it's kind of wherever you want. Um, from an international standpoint, I've been fortunate enough to go to Iceland, South Africa, France, Portugal, and Italy, and Scotland. And all of those places had some amazing stuff. And you know, I just scratched the surface. So I'm hoping to be able to go back sometime in the future. Who knows? I've realized I'm a lot more daring than my husband would like me to be um, as far as going to different areas. Um, and that color is an important thing. I mean, uh, black and white, and you know, we have too many neutrals in our lives, we need more color. And that's part of the thing that appeals to me about that. And I realized that that was equally important for me. I studied large format photography like this about 2006 in Kabul, Afghanistan when I first discovered a big large format photos there and it was on photo paper and for the last 15 years I've been doing this and as soon as I moved to America I decided to do the American way with the tin type wet great colonial. It's a process from around 1850s 1850s was widely used during a civil war so you see all those portrait in uh, portrait galleries and stuff shot with this te technology um, it's, uh, it's called wet plate photography because you need to shoot while the plate is still wet. So you can't, you need to move around with your dark room and all your chemicals and everything. You can't do it dry like the later photography, like 1900 photography. It's full of problem. It's, it's, it ne it's never perfect, but that's what I love and we all love about it. It's the uh, imperfection. Uh, I mean, when it's too hot, it's faster. When it's too cold, it's slower. When it's windy, you need to change. It's always different. It goes with the climate. So there is a lot of problem all the time, but it's what make every photo unique. You can't even expect, you can never expect something perfect. I mean, it's always unique. The process is, I take photo on a piece of aluminum, with black aluminum, and I pour my chemical on it, which is called collodion, that's why it's called wet pet collodion. I pour my collodion on it, and it's got a very thin film of collodion that I sensitize for like three minutes in my dark room. And once it's sensitized, pop it into the camera, take the photo, develop, fix, and it's finished. So it's like a 10 minute process, and right away you get your photo on a piece of uh, tin. It used to be tin, that's why it's called tin type, and now it's uh, aluminium because it's easier to find, it's light. The person could be there only for a few seconds if uh, we are in a rush. I mean, all I do is open, close the shutter for like two seconds. But the whole sitting together and waiting for the, the chemical to get ready is like half of the experience is this. And then the last part when you 
So I develop in my dark room, but then I come out with a negative. And when I fix it, it turns into a positive. And that's the little magic thing that we all wait for and see what's gonna come out at the last minute. So I love, I love to do portraits because you really, with the, the slow process and the sitting time, you really capture something from people, you know, and it's a little bit deeper portraits because you take your time and you talk with the people. And, but it's also great for nature. It's like it got this very romantic view of nature, you know, like the romanticism photography from the early century. So yeah, I... I love both, but uh, yeah, I love to do portrait mostly, I think. It's really nice. I learned to be very patient. <laughs> it's, a lot of, it's a lot of patience. Uh, yeah, it's mostly a lot of patience and accepting, accepting the mistake and embracing them. You need to embrace all the imperfection and that makes the photo better if you, if you love your imperfection, it's better. Just come to my studio and get a nice portrait. I got a really good setup there. <laughs> I've been making art for about 20 years and um, self-taught. I was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and my TV broke, actually, and was looking for something more creative to do. So I started making artwork, just using a lot of weird found objects, stuff that I found. and. Then I've moved through a few different styles. Uh, the work I'm doing now is uh, in caustic. It's, uh, I make collages and use old pulp fiction, sci-fi novels, photos, and then cover them with a melted mix of beeswax and resin. Then use a heat gun to fuse it together to create kind of a little layered uh, well, for a while I was uh, taking vinyl records, melting them in an oven, shaping them, using spray paint, and putting found objects in those, and um, I just made a couple pieces with cicada exoskeletons. There's so many of them lying around, I figured uh, I should use them for something. So I'll use a lot of different, just weird stuff that I can find to make art. There's only a certain amount of my work we want to hang in our house and we have a lot of art by other people too so a lot of it still has to stay in in my studio until i sell it <laughs> fortunately we have a basement now where i have my studio but uh yeah there's a lot of art down there and then with the encaustic i have to have a pancake griddle and uh a heat gun so there's a fair amount of equipment so i'm glad i have some space Actually, I took a welding class, which an oxyacetylene torch, which I really enjoyed. But the idea of getting even more of that equipment, and I've got two young kids, and having a blowtorch around and a bunch of rusty metal probably wouldn't be a great combo. But I'd, I'd love to do some more sculpture as well. I guess I I do it just as a creative outlet, and for some reason I'm sort of driven to keep making more even though my studio is already packed with a lot of artwork and as far as what it presents about me I guess just sort of more of a creative quirky side it's really up to you know individual people to decide sort of what they think about it but people generally have a pretty positive reaction to the work we're a group of volunteers that um, helps guide city council and the mayor into policies about the about arts and the humanities. So there's seven of us right now, and we are. I'm a dancer. Uh, we have writers. We have visual musicians. We have poets on the commission. So and we're all just a group of people that volunteer because we love the arts and we love Tacoma Park. Well, hopefully, once we get back into post-COVID, we'll hopefully get back into like our film series in person, our poetry series in person. We've been doing those, but virtually. Hopefully we'll also get back into some live performance in the community center. And hopefully what I'm really looking forward to is, is getting the galleries open again and getting artwork put up into the actual community center that then can be enjoyed by, any, by the public. Mm -hmm.